stage there, and they start taking on this persona and entering into certain, what I would say uh, would be folk ideas or folk patterns. So uh, there's uh, one person from Latvia is actually grown up in California, but he's from Latvia, but he's made to represent Latvia. For example, and I will just uh, stop on this note. Many of you know Bjornsson, who is the mountain in Game of Thrones. He started as a strongman competitor, and as you know from the show, he doesn't do much speaking or acting. He's just there to be, to be big. But he's been put in the position of representing Iceland. He's very, very aware of that. And you can do an article, and I invite you to do it. I'm not playing a uh, turf in uh, on him as uh, symbolizing the country rather than the sun. Thank you very much for uh, worthy Dardesian tradition. Um, there's one area where I, I did see you know, the connection at all, and that is. Are you mainly talking about things that, are in a sense, are heirs to the Greek traditions or the Western world? Because the most famous strongman in the world, which one of my students, Kenji Jenny, wrote his dissertation about, is Sumo. Yeah. They don't follow the Greek tradition, I think. No. But do, can we say the same kinds of things about <coughs> them, or is that another world? Well, I did teach in, in Japan, and I was uh, fascinated with uh, Sumo. I think there is a different context, and we could talk later as well, because some of the context there is that a lot of it is a modern creation of village and pre-Meiji love. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. So you walk out into the ring and the referee spreads salt. And we would know that that is supposed to ward off evil, right? And there's also this whole thing about the bowing and the ring and it's supposed to, the championships are during the time of fertility. And soon you wrestle to increase fertility. Of course, it's a very competitive situation. And I saw at the time that I was there a lot of resentment against Mongolian mm -hmm. sumo wrestlers who were, yeah. who were coming in because this is a Japanese pre- yeah, so they, they aren't quite within this tradition, although Greco-Roman wrestling is. Now, and a lot of the strongmen either have an aside like Mark Henry as wrestlers or came up from, from wrestling or from... So this actually is a very, uh, thank you for a, a great talk and a, a wonderful uh, segue into my question, oh. which is, uh, uh, Kind of a different. It's a, it's a question really of classification and differentiation. Uh, so you've kind of talked both about bodybuilders uh, yes. and strongmen, which uh, are at least uh, from the outside seem to be two very different types of uh, uh, traditions. And yes. then uh, you brought up sumo and face-to-face -face, uh, physical uh, fighting that yeah. feeds on your question about boxing, whereas strongman competitions are side by side or uh, group competitions and don't actually, uh, 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 unlike sumo, uh, rely on face-to-face uh, -face competition. I'm thinking here in, in the context of mixed martial arts and ultimate fighting yes. machine. Is that what it's called? The ultimate fighting stuff. Uh, <coughs> uh, which all seem to it's be uh, UFC. Ultimate, ultimate fighting, ultimate fighting, fighting combat. combat. Yeah, which seem to be uh, uh, if we if we're making some sort of uh, representation of these perhaps overlapping spaces. I'm curious if you could comment about uh, the spillovers, the differentiation, yes. and the perception of individuals who practice and perform this uh, of these other groups. It's an excellent point, and I am sorting through that as well. <clears throat> there is certainly overlap. It is true that a lot of the strong men think that the bodybuilding contest is aesthetic. It's not functional strength, and that's where they take great pride in the farmer's walk and these other kinds of activities that they call functional strength because they're related to work. 
the union or the synthesis is often in the old-time heroes as legends because they looked great, they looked like Greek gods, and they were strong. So Eugene Sanda, true, would flex and would pose, but he would also do these feats of strength. There is indeed more of a separation now, although what they have connected uh, to them, I think, is this idea of combat manliness. They're often about the expression of muscular strength, even if they don't have muscles. Part of what I notice, especially in the strongman gyms, is uh, they're not well-defined bodies. They're not generally muscular. In fact, you saw Zadrunas Zavikis there with on the poster. He's flabby, but he's strong. It's also true that Lithuania and Latvia have state-sponsored drug programs, that they can do this kind of strongman as professionals every day we tend not to do in America. It's more underground. And certainly some of them engage in combat as part of the trope, but they're concerned with poundage. They're concerned with the breaking of records, of exceeding bodily limits. That's more their thing where it's true with the Arnold Schwarzenegger tradition, it's more showing off the, the body and muscular development and what is possible to do. I promise. <laughs> uh, thanks for the talk. It was cool to, this is not something that I think about in my day to day, so okay. it was good for me to learn about. Um, I'm really interested in how we got to the point of like the idea that a strong person is also not a smart person. Yeah. Um, because a, an example, this is really just one example that came to my mind was the thinker. And the thinker is like very muscular, but the whole thing is that they're thinking, um, and he's thinking. And so that's just one example, but I'm just curious yeah. if you could talk a little bit more about like how we arrive at that idea that the strong man is not the smart man. Well, I would say that this is an example where we can talk about folklore shaping ideas. That the reason that happened may not be based on reality, it's what people say is reality, and some of that is compensation for their own feelings of inadequacy, and this, for many people, has become a competition between brains and brawn, as if they can't be together. Uh, there are some ways that you can see this in commentary. Uh, any of you are football fans know that it's often the view that quarterbacks are smart. So they're the one smart person on the field. Everybody else is just pushing, right? And they're just following orders. But the quarterback is, is supposed to be smart. So we see a lot of ways in which these legends and, in fact, folk tales of giants, in addition, uh, fall into this view of, uh, you remember Jack and the Beanstalk, Five 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 smell the smell of an Englishman uh, from early on that shapes our thinking. So the, the other question is how do you break patterns? And often you can have counter traditions uh, for that and, you, and that's part of the killing tradition that I was interested in because you had animal rights people who had one kind of narrative, you had the counter animal writes people who had a different narrative and they weren't just arguing with each other because they weren't going to convince each other but they were telling different stories to one another for a public audience. So that, that, that's what I would say. Yes, that's not a contradiction to say you're, you're smart and powerful or you're an athlete but uh, even, you know, the, since I did a book on campus tradition there's a lot of worry that athletes are assumed to be there because they only play well and not because they have a right to be there. And that, I, I think, is a symptom that we have to uh, address. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for uh, very detailed talk. It was very interesting. Um, I, I want to think more about strength and because of the 
And then I achieved my goal tonight. And then hopefully you want to buy the book later. <laughs> it's not out yet, but I'm working. Um, but you talked about this revitalized Scandinavian traditions. There was an image of a man lifting. And you, yeah. you said that was not an inventive tradition for the folklorization. And how do you, um, like, can you elaborate on um, what, how you think that yeah. was the difference? Well, this is one point that's different from, I think, what Jay saw when I presented this. Yeah. Being in the Midwest, there is some inferiority complex about that, that it's a place that no one else wants to live. So only Scandinavians can live, possibly, in Wisconsin and Minnesota. In the cold, I once asked the stupid question, any of you who follow football, why don't they dome Lambeau Field, which is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and then they have games in December? And what I was told, they like it like that. They can show how hardy they are. It seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? But there, this will lead to the point. So the use of the invocation of what they view as the Vikings, or at least the Vikings in popular culture, as uh, being brutes, as being able to withstand the incredible cold to face all obstacles, I think is one that they've taken on as their own persona. That's the way that I would see it. So wearing a Viking hat may seem silly to you in this photo that you see here, but when you're there, is it uh, more silly than wearing a cheese head, for example? But I would see some comparable aspects that they, they know that when this is televised, they look silly. Damn, they're proud of it because it makes them different, and it also justifies why they're still there. And they're not all in Northern California, 70 degree <laughs> temperature. So, so that's what I, you may have the, other yeah. uh, thoughts about it. Uh, interesting, I don't see so much with the Danish community, but it, especially taking on in Western Wisconsin, the Norwegian <coughs> community, uh, very much has the these regions are a little bit, mm -hmm. well, regions are kind of a little bit dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, um, your talk raised many different questions, and one that the last. I hope you made, address the folkloristic ones too. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to get to one of those. I mean, partly also the thinking about why all those fans are sitting and freezing there. There, yeah. Some parts of their bodies off there. What about reception? What about we've talked a lot about the performers here. Yeah. What about the 100,000 people who come to watch? What is it for them, and how do they, in some sense, participate? I mean, you know, audience and all that. How are they constructing traditions of both strongman um, and bodybuilding? The second question is probably back in the, you know, there was a time in the 70s and 80s when folkloristics was in where? It was in your brain, it was in your mouth, and it was in your ears. And I think there was a time at which a number of us sort of rebelled under the name of body lore and began to say, well, actually, maybe the body could be more fundamentally involved. <clears throat> a lot of things might be involved, not starting in the brain, and then you've got a body saying the words. But you know, what's the role of the body, and how might that be fundamentally, even analytically, to thinking about folklore? So yes. I see a potential great contribution here in terms of rethinking some of the fundamental understandings. I mean, you've worked a lot on tradition, other notions. Where does this particular way, because this is really rooted in the body and in the making of the body, so yes. how does this in some sense potentially push the envelope <coughs> uh, for thinking about bodies in relationship to folklore? It's a great question and I hope at some point we can team teach a whole seminar <laughs> on that question. I think that that would be great. I can say some quick thoughts, uh, maybe then we can have further conversation. Let me start with your latter question. Yes, absolutely true. This has made me think about moving from material culture to physical culture in the sense of the body as an object unto itself. I was trained ethnologically to think that I was studying an external object for what its content was rather than what the role of the body is in shaping it and being part of the whole scene. So that's what I see ethnographically is occurring here. And so it's, you're right, it's not just 
what is being said or even how it's being said, but what is the role of the body in that communication and in that symbolization and how the brain, quite frankly, uh, shapes the way those reactions are gauged. The first point about the reaction, uh, yes, there was some editing here, and I do pay attention uh, to that. When Jay and I did ethnography, for example, in Higgins, I was inside the park, and Jay was with the animal rights protesters and just noting the things that they said to one another that, again, in the previous generation, folklorists might have thought of as <coughs> conversation. But now, I saw it as examples of cognition that is based upon folk ideas. So that's where I was looking at. So what I mentioned about who's your daddy, one of the things that constantly occurs in the gym is somebody trying to achieve a personal goal. And the idea is that people would gather and support that person. It's not just saying, go, 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 break the record. But they would often resort to these kinds of phrases that outside of that scene might seem offensive. So the, that's the place where they would say, uh, who's your daddy, or, or get it up, or I see that you have a heart on for this, uh, this kind of thing. And uh, so that does become important in the embedding of these metaphors within that culture and what situations in which they are appropriate. One of the ideas in my football <coughs> article, which is a little different from Alan's, is that I sensed as a participant, as well as a spectator, that football same was a place where people can express emotions in ways that they can't elsewhere. And I know Jay has talked about this as, as well. Why? Does everyone pile on each other after the end, even of a baseball game? Which, and that would seem very strange in another situation. And some of that is because it's the expression of emotion that they feel they may not be able to do in everyday life, but they might have been able to do that previously. And that's where some of the modernization comes in. So I hope that at least that plants some seeds, if you will, to uh, move on to that. And I look forward to further conversations. And one of the reasons I seriously do put my email, if you want to continue the conversation uh, by email or conferences, by all means, I, I want to hear from you. Well, I want to thank uh, Nisha Kumar over there for actually making this possible, putting on the event and bringing the wonderful food. Uh, speaking of the body, we have <laughs> lots of great food and even some wine to sort of, you know, to, um, to enliven the interaction. Um, so please stick around, continue speaking with Dr. Bronner, but let's thank him for his time.